All right, John. Okay. There you are. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can totally hear you, which what? is uh, which means it must be working, which is <laughs> That's a shame. crazy. That huh? can't be right. It's crazy. <laughs> cool. So click screen share. Uh, this, screen is, this, share. Is, this is the pre show, everybody. Screen you share. Click screen share. It says you to like. install something. It's like a little Chrome. What's it? Wait, it's it says. Install the in. screen sharing extension and load your app over HTTPS. I yeah, we're loaded over. We are over HTTPS, but you need to get the extension. Well, where do I get it? Um, when you click on that, oh, what is the screen sharing extension? Let's ask tech support. So click on the little chat in the lower corner. Yeah. Let's see the numbers is 48 people. Yes. And then Aerial Spaces tech support. Yep. That should be Tiffany, and she should tell us what's going on. Magical. And I think I need to. Yeah, she should tell you how to do that. And then you can close the chat with by clicking the sideways chat thing. how to close it oh uh, you click on the sideways i thought you click on the hamburger you actually click on the sideways chat that says space chat i don't see a thing that says space chat it's hovering like over the left side of oh your there face. it is okay yeah and Got then it just slides back into the drawer okay all good oh there it is did you get that chat i did not i will send it to you it's right here she sent it to me there it is I will install it too. It's a it's the aerial space right. screen sharing widget cool. thing. All right. Okay. And add it to Chrome. Cool. So now I can share. So let me try it. Actually, let me share my screen. All right. Just a second. And you tell me if you see anything. There's my screen. Uh, wait just a sec. I'm installing the thing. Yep, I see your screen. So there is this here. So this should be us. Cool. Okay. So I see you and your shared screen at the same time. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's cool. It is cool. Although I can't change, I can't do garment changes during the stand up like I used to. Do you usually change your outfits in the middle of the show? A, I put on a sport coat once. <laughs> and I had okay. the the cat with, yeah. with that. Yeah. Now when you when you stop screen sharing, make sure you click stop screen sharing and not stop beam. Okay. That would stop everything. All right, here we go. Damien says he's setting up. Oh, gosh. Well, it's okay. It's pre-show. Pre-show. Uh, awesome. Okay. Can I show See you that I got, I got a new... Can I show you this? Uh, is that a dial? Oh, Alexa. It's 3.36 p.m. Yeah. yeah I've, gotten this, I've gotten this tech demo from my dad about 20 times. You know what else I got? What? My Christmas gift. I opened it early. Is that a Vive? Yeah, man. Wow. You're it's living in the future. I am. Yeah. And you know, I got like, I got like the, 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 this is the thing, the gadget that you shoot with. Mm -hmm. Apparently it looks at the knobbies or something, these little holes, and that's how it knows Wow. where it lives. So now I'm 3D printing stuff to hold the thing. Sure. Like, uh -huh. <laughs> I'm living the dream. That's my, that's my staycation. That's pretty cool. All right. So Damien is setting up. Oh, I'm kind of setting up. Now, on there the side go. there, we should see tweets go by as well. On the right-hand side, it says tweets about ASP.NET, so people should be able to tweet. Yeah. Send me the URL again. There you go. Password in your email, John and I. In. Okay, cool. And I'm going to get ready to tweet again. Okay. Ordinarily, for those of you who are watching the pre-show, uh, we would uh, not let you see this, but since we're trying a new tool instead of Google Hangouts, uh, this is called Aerial Spaces. And uh, if you look in the upper left-hand corner, which is Aerial Spaces, 
if you click on that, it'll, it'll end this. So you might want to right click on that and say, open a new window. Uh, you can learn about aerial spaces. And uh, we've got Tiffany from that team on the chat right here. And uh, sh you can click on the hamburger, uh, not on the hamburger menu, on the chat down there. Right now we have 68 people online. You can wow. see Tiffany marked as, yeah, already, and we haven't even done anything yet. It's She's marked game. as aerial spaces tech support. She's actually the uh, chief uh, technology officer and CEO and all that. And uh, she'll answer questions about the, the tool if you like. All right. Let's get ready. Do, 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 do. Damien should appear, I believe, in a second. And I'm going to get my tweet ready. The ASP.net. Oh, there he is. Wrong camera. <laughs> How do I change the camera? Right click on the little camera icon in the um, Chrome toolbar there uh, and pick the camera. Oh, in the oh Chrome, top right. Top right, click it, and then pick your camera and your microphone. God damn. Yes. You're being recorded. Yeah, this is all live, Damien. Oh, this is the pre show. Oh, pre I wish. Okay, make sure you tell me that before. I, like, <laughs> yes. Sorry, Damien. You're in the pre-show. <laughs> okay, so I changed the camera and like nothing happened. Probably okay. reload. Okay, I will refresh. I, I will I like give you. That, I like the way that he disappears and then the thing. There like, we go. Then it comes back. See. Ooh, ooh. Look at that. There he is. Exciting. Uh, oh, wait a second. Zoom. Insert profanity here. It wasn't bad. As profanity goes. Insert profanity here. It wasn't bad. No, your original profanity. I don't even know what I said now. Or as the normal pregame goes. I have no filter. All right. How can I let them know I have no inner monologue? <laughs> <laughs> Camera right. looks totally crooked. Is it because it is crooked? It's because the cleaners keep bumping it or something. I don't know. Well, I mean, it's like get a matchbook, right? I'll go and see if I can straighten it up. It's bugging it's me. Bothering you. All right. I'm going to Moscow next week, and I just realized it's cold there. It is cold in Moscow. I've heard. I that. may need some warm clothes. Am I using the wrong mic? Which mic is live, John? Uh, yes. No. Yes. Hello. Oh, yeah, that's a good question for me. That's the one that's live. Yeah, you can right-click up in the browser, because this is all using, this Aerial Spaces is using WebRTC and Magic. I like that. It's uh, mostly Magic, from what I can tell. Because it just works. We didn't have to install any plugins. It just showed up. And then this is all going to be put into a single video file, and then we'll have every, every stream. Do you have the screen sharing thing ready to go? Uh, well, maybe. Actually, it's good you said that. Okay, so I'm. Screen. Uh, okay. Screen okay. share. Oh, wait, just a second. Whoa, what is? It's like totally looks like it's gonna work. Okay, wait just a second and share. You have to hit screen. share and then you pick the screen and then you. Oh, and then I. Oh, look at that! I can see you. You can see me and my screen. Time. Right. That's what I'm saying. I can't pick my nose while I'm sharing my screen anymore. It's exciting, though. Or change clothes. Okay. So, Damien, Scott totally forgot that I changed into a sport coat during one of these things. <laughs> you remember. I do. That, didn't you want to time you wore a well. sport coat? All right. Let's, uh, let's start the show. Oh, we're like a bit early, aren't we? Are we? Oh, I guess we are. Three minutes early. Two minutes early. early. That's, go that's go never going to work. Go and retweet my thing, uh, okay. John. There it is. Uh -huh. I just sent it to you. I, Again, this is the pre-show. You are watching the pre-show. I see that you utilized the new feature that I added to the... Uh, I did. That was really cool that you did that, actually. We sh you should maybe show that. But um, well, it was I, really easy. I, I went on earlier with, yeah. uh, with the Aerial Spaces folks, and it was easy. You said put in streaming embed here. I did have to change a little JavaScript, not JavaScript, uh, CSS. To mm -hmm. make it fill the screen appropriately. Yep. But it looks great. Yep. Um, right now we are getting. It looks like we might be getting a warning on Edge, but no. uh, otherwise it looks it looks great on uh, 
on other browsers here. I'm testing it out. What sort of warning on it? Uh, someone got a uh, incompatible browser. Might just be a feature JavaScript thing. All right, cool. We've got 88 people so far, and we haven't even started yet. Well, one of them was me, so I just hit stop. <laughs> was, oh, now it's 94. Now it's 94, so that means that like 10 of those people are you. Oh, John, good. did you re retweet that from the ASP.net? I did. Is there a chat? I did. Did, I, did I? Is there? A chat? Uh, there is a chat. Um, how do we do chat? So we click on the 94. Meet the host. Which I totally 88 did. in the bottom left. And then ah. double click on ASP.net stand up. Double click. Okay. Oh, now it's and like a window. And then you can actually, yeah, you can actually, and then click the little arrow that points it out, and you can jump out into another thing. Wait, what? And when you uh, double click on it, you double click on ASP.NET Stand Up. There's a, a box with an arrow pointing to the upper right. How do mm -hmm. I make this thing that flew out from the left go away again? Uh, oh. Push on the space the chat is, sideways right? tab. I got it. Yep, I got it. And then take the little chatty deal if you don't like it. And then there's an arrow pointing to the upper right. Yeah. That'll pop it into a no, new It fits window. out quite well because there's three of us anyway. Oh, yeah, hang I on. Just I'm, oh, who's, who's sharing this screen? Is that you, John? Yeah, that's oh, John's uh, screen. So oh, I can't, I I can't move myself. Is that right? No, I haven't figured out how to move ourselves yet. Okay. I've stopped sharing my screen. But I can yeah. see tweets. and so, Okay, cool. Yeah, all right. This is good. Has it started? So if I pop that out. 345. Is there Let's a way start to lower time. the volume? Yes. With the volume control. <laughs> Is that like Sorry. saying the eyes of a zoom function? Yes, walk closer to the device that you want to zoom up on. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's weird. I, I, volume should be just the volume. Now, interestingly, we had 98 people, and then suddenly it's at 16. Oh. Where that are you seeing that count? I'm not Lower left corner. That's the number of chats, isn't it? 105, it says. I think it's the number of currently logged in. No, it's top right. It says 52 participants. Joined That's the room. number of chats, but then if I click on ASP.NET stand-up. I, no, saw, I, saw, I saw. I see 30 that in the ASP.NET stand-up chat. There was like 130, 170 people or something like that. And I see yeah, 54 I see. participants joined the room, it says, in the top right. You now a ton of people are going into the chat room. Okay. If you click on the... Um, hamburger menu in the in the chat you can nice. um you can you can uh, check change your name, name. log yeah. in to change your name i am logged in hmm. uh you have to just do the guest thing and log in as a, it's a different it, they don't have uh off yet they don't have oh, okay. off. i say damien edwards save ten oh i got a javascript there okay Oh, John, just leave. Oh, it just crashed my chat window. Oh, dear. Okay. That's all right. All right. We will recover. Oh, yeah, my chat window just died. Let me see if I can pop it out again. Yep, I'm over there. People are talking. Oh, it alternates between viewers and chats. That's what's going on. It's going back and forth between chats and viewers. All right, there are 111 uh, people now. All right. I, I all managed right. to click the wrong button and went into the lobby. But I'm okay. back. Well, keep taking notes because this is all in staging. It uh, looks like the number one request here is that there's troubles in Edge. Okay. But, uh, I came back into the chat window good. and my nickname did seem to take. So even though yeah. the, an error came up once I reloaded it, it has my name. Yeah, yeah. I would like one one login and then one. Yeah, yeah. And then all of our names show up. Actually, it's, so it's cool though. If you look on the chat, we see that there's people in Kuala Lumpur. The Dutch have shown up. Oh, it has flags. Is that yeah, automatic? Is that IP geo? It's automatic. Yeah, it's automatic. Do geo look automatically? Fancy. Do the stream look really good too. The best part. The best part about this experience is that John uh, keeps falling off. <laughs> well, it's because I'm clicking on things that boot me out without warning. So You're just clicking on random stuff. I clicked so on dashboard. Don't click stuff. I would think I could click on a dashboard. Ah, so there's feedback. Then just put. They should put target equals blank on links that could cause you to leave the. Yeah. The stream. Yep. Cool. We'll take we'll take notes. This is beta. And this is why we're testing it. Well, and and it's 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 at not least as intuitive right. as as the YouTube interface is, right? So <laughs> uh, yeah, it is far more intuitive than YouTube. So I'm looking <laughs> at right. the I'm looking at the live stream, and I'm only seeing you, Scott. Did you like do some director stuff or? No, I'm seeing a thin sliver on the left hand side, which is just your video, and then nothing okay. else. Let me let me go and see. And when I was in there before, I did see all of this. So I think we may have. I'm. I just went. Okay, so I just went to this location, stages dot aerial space, and I did it in 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 um 
incognito mode and all three of us are there. We're live right now. All three of us can I'm, see. I'm on live.asp.net. I'm looking at the embed. Okay, so you're at live.asp.net. Yeah. And you hit start. And I see all of us as well. Yeah. And I'm seeing screenshots of that exact experience. Hmm. So I'll hit refresh. Try incognito mode. I'll hit refresh. Damien, no, you're, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. That's okay. what guest 982 says. Yeah. And I saw, yeah. Uh, so, oh. oh. Someone says less lag than Hangouts. So where did you change your name? It's up again now. I clicked on the chat, on the chat in the lower left corner, and then I clicked on the hamburger menu, right. and then it asked me to log in, and I said no, I logged in as a guest, and then I just changed my name. Huh. Change my See, now there's two Damien's. Oh, oh you really? logged in twice, Damien. Oh. oh. Maybe it's from two Windows. You have two Windows Incognito thing. Let me do do I tell it log in as guest or do I say log, log in with email? I just said log in as guest and That's refuse to, to the email. I feel like we should start as opposed yeah. to picking on this, picking on this interface because this is still pretty smooth. Super awesome. Thumbs up. Not nice that I have to install Chrome to watch the stand up. Okay, yeah, we heard you. Not working in Edge apparently. For that. Yeah, Web that RTC hurt. should work fine in Edge. Just for I'm sure it's just a detection thing because it is. Uh, it, it, it has a WebRTC. Okay, cool. 124. All right, here we go. Hey, everybody. It is the ASP.NET Community Standup. It is the 22nd of November, and we're trying out a new system here. Uh, if you're watching this after the fact, you may still be watching it on YouTube, but what we will have done is made a composite video using this tool. The tool is called Arial Spaces, and you can check it out on twitter.com slash use Arial. Uh, they've been very kind to let us try this out, and uh, let us know what you think. You can tweet myself, John, or Damien, or email me your opinions, uh, and uh, check it out. I think it's pretty cool. It has a lot of potential. This is a, a new startup that we're trying out. So, uh, Damien. Yo. How are you? Oh. <laughs> He's checking email. I'm I'm actually looking at the live ASP.NET website. Like I'm actually like watch, watching it as a person. And I'm double clicking on the videos and because like, oh, okay. you, know, you can actually control it as a as a as a user. Oh, okay. So like if I double click on you, then you get big and we get small. Wow. And if I double click again, they all go like to three even sizes again. So okay. Um, yeah. No, You're I'm already off doing user testing. That's I'm off doing user testing. I'm trying to experience what the people are experiencing right now. Well, yeah. Someone says that they want to have the CSS use all the screen space. There should be like a full screen button. Lots of potential here. Yeah. yeah. Cool. John, for do sure. you have the community links for I today? do. I do. All right. Uh, sharing, and here we go. All right. So uh, we have got uh, – so first of all, if you, you know, like officially kind of post, there's um, – there's the announcement post on ASP.NET Core, um, so that's exciting. Um, that was last week. Hang on, didn't we already ship ASP.NET Core? I feel like that sentence was missing. Our Core one one RTM. <laughs> yes. Yay! Yippee! It's hooray! The, first day the Connect event, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, a lot's happened, and we actually yeah, had a lot's happened a few weeks in a row. So this one okay. has a lot of good, you know, review of. I'm looking at your desktop. Oh goodness, that's because I changed. There it is. Okay. There you go. So. <laughs> Uh, now, do you still see me? Yes, I do. Okay, so I'm going to be turned sideways, and that's just yeah, how I can't. Going. I haven't found the way to turn you off. Okay, so but um, you can double click and like, make yeah. it bigger. Cool. All oh, right, so you can double click. ASP Core oh, One You can double. Hang on. You can double click on the link on the picture yes. of of John's desktop, and it goes full screen. Yes, okay. it's bigger anyway. Yeah. Ooh, that's nice. Okay. Good. Good. All right. So lots of good stuff in here, including ASP Net Core support for Visual Studio for Mac, a lot of good stuff. Um, there's also the .NET Core 1.1, which of course is quite related to ASP.NET Core. Um, so good stuff in here as well, St explaining how to install and all that. One other thing that got announced uh, at the Connect event was uh, ASP.NET Core on app service for Linux. So this is the app service that actually is like using Docker under the hood and it's it's all, you know, so you're actually running ASP.NET Core on Linux on app service. So um, that's that's pretty exciting. So just short little post there, but a good thing to be aware of. Um, also, we had the, um, the Tech Empower French framework benchmarks. So uh, ASP.NET Core now in the top 10. Uh, Big excitement, so that that was neat to it's see. It's actually the first round we've been in at all. <laughs> so we've talked about it a 
now for like a year now, right? It's just right. Well, we year. were we were in there kind of as ASP.NET on Mono like a while back, right? So, I mean, we the framework was in there. We didn't do that work. So some oh. community member had previously submitted um, MVC five, I think, running on Mono uh, mm -hmm. back when. Uh, yeah, so a, a long time back. And then there was one round where Tech and Power did run some stuff on Windows. I think it was round nine. And there was a version of MVC, again, MVC 5 running IS. They had, they, we had some numbers there for that. But the ASP.NET Core has not been in any of these rounds until this round, round 13. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, this is the first time we finally got some, uh, some numbers. This is actually numbers for version 101. So that was uh, 1.0.1, .1, not the version that we just shipped, which actually Because it takes a while to run these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like, we, we've been working on stabilizing these tests in the Tech and Power benchmarks for a, like, a while, and like, we didn't want to just push it too far and say, hey, let's take the 1.1 stuff that isn't even public yet and try and stabilize on that. So effectively what happened is 1.1 went public on NuGet the same day that these tests went public, so we couldn't really line those two things up. So round 14, which they're currently slating to be done much quicker than previous rounds. They're, they're moving to a continuous testing model now, so they're hoping round 14 will land in January. Uh, we'll get those onto 1.1, and we do have uh, some small improvements in 1.1 that will make that faster. And then we're currently hard at work on the version after that, where we're expecting much, much larger gains. So we're doing an awful lot of work to um, to really revisit Perf. Like we're happy we, we landed at number 10 on plain text in this round, which you know is all right. Um, but we'd love to get much higher up there. Um, plus, for the other tests, we do we are in each of the test types. So we're in JSON, we're in all the database, and we're in Fortunes, which is the one that does HTML rendering and database. This one's most like a real app. Mm -hmm. um, we're nowhere near as high up on those ones. You know, we're we're kind of halfway down. We're not terrible. We're nowhere near as bad as we used to be. But we're certainly not up in the top ten, top twenty like we are in plain text. Um, so we're working really, really hard to fix that uh, for the version after one point one. And so is that, is that pretty that. important to differentiate the difference between kind of like the, the bare metal middleware version of the test, the MVC yes. version of the test? Yeah, so like one of the things that we that we do is that in case we, for each of these tests, we kind of submit at least two flavors. One of them is kind of the raw middleware flavor. We don't have a raw server flavor. So Tech and Power categorizes their tests um, such that there is a, the lowest layer is something called platform. And the idea there is like you're testing just the web server and like no app composition, no routing primitives, nothing at all. We don't actually have an API for that. Like you can't easily boot Kestrel mm -hmm. and say, just stand up with me a web server, please, and don't even understand what middleware is. If we did have that, then we would submit that as a platform layer. But the, 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 the lowest layer that we really expose is the, you know, obviously the startup class with the I application builder and building up the pipeline with middleware. So that's our, that's our bare metal test. And that we, we classify that as a micro framework using mm -hmm. tech and powers classification because it has basic routing primitives and you know, dispatching and that type of stuff. And so we are actually one of the highest of that classification. And then the next stage is full framework, which is we have a version in there that's MVC. So we have plain text for MVC, where you're going through full routing through uh, full MVC action selection and invocation. Um, and we still fare pretty well. So I think even with full MVC, we end up being faster than node, um, like raw node on the plain text test specifically. And again, that test is only testing how fast you can respond to a, an HTTP request, basically, and pipeline 15 deep to really stress you as hard as you right. possibly It is go. literally a hello world on the web mm. test. It, and it's like, it, it's a ridiculous hello world. Like, all they're trying to test is how fast can you speak HTTP. That's literally all they're trying to test. Okay. Um, you know, which is valuable. It's the, it's the right. cheapest so thing it's, you should be able to do. This is like the whole zero, like the example that's fair to point out is like zero to 60. Like they always have like a Tesla against a million dollar supercar. Sure. And they have all these arguments about, well, this one went from zero to 10 faster. And then once, once it was past 60 miles an hour, this car went faster. Mm -hmm. You can argue about those things all the day. But this is a constrained test on mm -hmm. the middle with, you know, the well, fastest again, possible. That's why Tech and Power has more than one scenario. So exactly. plain text it was the, it was the base scenario that's just trying to test HTTP, and we landed at number 10. Mm -hmm. We haven't done as well in the other tests, but that's our next goal is to get top 10 in all of them, and then you know then we'll work our way up the top 10. Like, well, we really do care about making this good. As you explained earlier on too, Damien, the idea was to start at the bottom of the stack, right, and get the fundamentals like the yeah, basic course. serving and then build up to the more application level stuff. As you go. Yeah, because if you're paying, you know, if it, you're going to hit a limit pretty quickly if your web server just isn't efficient enough, you know, to get mm -hmm. you past a certain point. So, cool, good All stuff. Right. Long way to go. Yep. 
Uh, so then we had a, a post uh, from Jeff about uh, Jeff Fritz about the hackathon at MVP Summit and some really cool stuff in here. Um, I'm not going to dig through all these, um, but there there is some cool stuff. There's one uh, Tomas did this one on this dot VVM, which is kind of feels a little bit like web forms as far as like kind of controls um, controls and stuff. So that's pretty neat. The ASP.NET monsters um, with this Pugzor drop in replacement for Razor engine. Um, uh, using Pug, all, all kinds of stuff. So um, lots of good stuff here. Um, I encourage you know reading this whole post in, in details. So that's neat. This one someone sent me over Twitter, and uh, it's an EDI serializer, deserializer for .NET Core. Mm -hmm. The, this stuff is more useful than you would think. Like there's a whole world out there that yeah, uses these kind of serializers. Exactly. And the reason I'm calling this out is exactly that. That the, for doing real world business applications, it's nice to seeing to see this kind of thing coming along for .NET Core now. Um, so yeah. this one actually under the hood is inspired and um, inspired and influenced by the work on Jason Jason .NET. So it's kind of kind of neat to see that. Another another thing to think about is if you look at um, logic apps in Azure, mm -hmm. and and how they think about biz talk and business and serialization of things. This works really nicely with you know you could make your own web API that took JSON and then serialized as EDI or whatever. If having f features like this available on core just makes life easier for anyone in that business. Yep. Uh, Jason Bell, he's writing about uh, the URL rewrite middleware behind a load balancer. So he talks about a, a problem he ran into and solution. So kind of nice. Interesting. If you wouldn't mind slowing down the yeah. scrolling just a smidge, the load balancer provided by AWS does a great job of terminating HTTPS, but then you have to force HTTPS because in the when you're behind the load balancer, you might not necessarily be HTTPS the whole way. Interesting. Yeah, you'd have to think about that. The more and more that you're going to run something like Core behind a piece, another another web server, you're going to have Kestrel behind Nginx behind a load balancer. Uh, you do have to think about the full life cycle because you could just say, you know, you typed in a URL and a miracle happened, you got an HTTP request. Right. But being aware of the headers that get injected or don't get injected, what's being changed about your your request definitely matter. Yep. Yeah, and he's running this on AWS as well, so he's he's you know digging into um, specifically how he did it there. But it it is definitely nice being able to get down as low as you need to with middleware um, and and solve what you need to. Uh, so uh, last was it last week or the week before? I don't know. It's all a blur. But I was on uh, ASP.NET Monsters, and uh, so um, reminder that these guys are continuing to crank stuff out. They're now on uh, episode 79. Um, so they, they're they cranking out a ton of content. Um, and I mentioned some things, uh, including the um, how things got on the community, or on the um, what we're doing right now, <laughs> the community stand up like link list. So as a reminder, you can always just tweet stuff to me, or if you tag things with ASP.NET Core, um, I, I watch for that stuff. Uh, Hisham, he's writing about something where he was surprised that the view localization was, he had expected it to look, to find something that was layout FR, FR, and instead it was FR, FR, FR. So um, this was, this was just something that he noticed um, and just kind of pointing out. And then he was saying that you can do it if you want to. Uh, okay, uh, this is Steve Gordon. He's writing about you know just kind of what's changed as you go from Project JSON to CS Proj. Um, so comparing and um, and explaining some new things here. Uh, this was a tweet I saw go by from uh, from the Orchard team and just saying like, hey, reminder, it's it's out. Like it's oh, already wow. updated. It's our it's a good reminder. It is already on .NET Core and they're up to date on one one. Exactly. Yep. It's and so not this a is a feature ready though. Just well, this wary. it is not fully feature ready. No, so no, no, Orchard, Orchard two is like not ready for like you can't just go and build a website in Orchard two this year. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So it is updated. Uh, right. yeah. Programs see. here. Yep. Okay. The promise yep. though is of a fully featured CMS oh, at some point in the future. Yes. Yep. And they say that you should be able to at least get a blog going. Yeah. Okay. In the you know in the short term. Cool. So this is from this is a new blog that I it's interestingly enough called Making Out with .NET. I'm not sure how I feel about that, but here's uh, how to serve a serve a static non MVC website uh, and web API at the same time using 
uh, ASP.NET Core, and this also includes a whole video on it as well. So kind of cool. New blog to keep an eye out for. It is nice when people do a blog post and then in include a short screencast mm -hmm. just to give you a sense. You know, it's just a nice balance of text and video. Absolutely. And you know, I really like the combination of code and video. Like code by itself is kind of nice. A video is good to explain it, but also a video by itself without code is kind of sometimes frustrating. I like to have both. <laughs> so this is really nice. Uh, cool. So here, uh, so Scott Allen talking, he's continuing his series on uh, core and the enterprise with a part three on middleware. Mm -hmm. So he's he's been doing this really nice uh, series just talking about ASP.NET Core and the enterprise and um, advantages, disadvantages, et cetera. A lot of good stuff. Uh, ben Foster talking about using .NET Core configuration with legacy projects. Um, and so that was a good go. post. I read that one. Cool. All right. Uh, this was just something that I saw come by. This was uh, CoreFX Lab and talking about high performance data pipelines and kind of looking at the future where they're planning to go with this. So, you know, the idea of like, hey, here's where we are currently, and then here's our roadmap as far as where we're looking to improve performance uh, long term. Yeah, so, so just to give some context there, because I don't think anyone would know what that was talking about. Um, pipelines is what we would form we were formally calling channels. And that okay. is some of the work that I was alluding to when I said that we are doing a whole bunch of work for vNext um, to make stuff even faster still. We're effectively building an alternate model to stream. So system.io contains the stream class, which is what you typically use for you know, doing high performance IO of some sort. Um, you get given a stream, it's generally full duplex, it might not be. You can wrap streams around each other, and then when you, when, you want, when you want to write to a stream, you put stuff into a byte buffer, your byte array, and then you give it to the right API, and if you want to read from a stream, you allocate a byte buffer. That is, you have a variable that is a byte array, and you make it, give it a size, and then you, you say to the stream, please fill this buffer with bytes. Um, channels, or pipelines, as they're now called, is a complete inversion of that model, where the pipeline gives you a buffer when data comes in, so you say await, the pipeline say please you know asynchronously await the current pipeline and then when uh, data comes in it gives you a buffer it gives you a byte array effectively it's a new type it won't be a byte array it's a special uh, low level primitive that's the red box you can see on the screen right now um so t memory t those type of things i buffer pool it gives you one of those and then you can deal with that thing and then when you're done you tell that you're finished with it and conversely when you want to write to the pipeline you ask it to give you one of those to fill in. So you basically alloc from the pipeline. You've put your data into it, and then you write that to the pipeline. The advantage of that model is that the pipeline is now in control of all the memory, which means that the pipeline can be responsible for doing efficient uh, buffer pooling and sharding and uh, dealing with uh, you know, ensuring that things are garbage collected at the right time or freed ahead of time if they can be. This is all the code that we do manually today in Kestrel. Anyone who's written high performance server code in .NET has to do this in order to get efficient use of buffers, otherwise the GC just kills you. Um, the idea here is that we bake this intrinsic into uh, the framework and the CLR itself, and then everyone can build high performance IO code on .NET using these new primitives um, and uh, these new libraries. So there would be a pipeline provider for sockets, and there would be a pipeline provider for the file system, and there would be a pipeline provider for libuv, and maybe a pipeline provider for Rio, the special registered IO APIs in Windows uh, 8 and above, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we would build new serialization primitives that don't allocate memory. So you can see like low alloc transforms and serialization there. Um, it's great if we can avoid the network cost of IO allocating memory, but what if I have to take bytes off the wire and turn them into JSON, or take these parts of the bytes and turn that into an int, because I'm parsing my custom payload. Today, those things cost you memory in .NET. They, they allocate a lot of memory generally, because everything takes a string. Um, so those blue boxes are very much about building new APIs that do all that stuff with no memory cost, and do them very quickly. Um, we showed a demo at the MVP Summit in the talk that this slide comes from. Um, where they did some tight loop doing sort of what you would do today, like the naive code you would write today with streams, and it allocated you know, some many hundreds of megabytes. Then they wrote the exact same example, but they did it using pipelines. Again, like a naive pipeline, if you just had the pipeline API and you followed IntelliSense, what code would you end up with? And it ended up allocating like 14 kilobytes. Mm -hmm. So it was multiple <laughs> orders of magnitude, and Fowler was very happy about that because it's, it's, it's maybe. Um, and that just proves that we have very low lag on this new technology. <laughs> yeah. um, 
so yeah, so the, the huge potential uh, for sort of revolutionizing .NET based IO programming uh, with this whole new stuff. So super excited about that. Also, kudos to people who make nice, clean boxes and lines diagrams like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was Zemo, I think. Well, I, know it sounds, I know it sounds silly, but as, as we are all struggling to get our heads around new systems, when a, when a well-organized stack of squares mm -hmm. shows up, I think we all kind of go, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Yep. At least yeah, I do. Huge. Like, Let's see if it's nice and colored like that. This is okay, and this is beautiful. Right? You know what I mean? Like going for yeah. like reading a wall of text is like you need yep. that information. It's a small thing, but it really matters. It really yep. does. Yeah, especially here, given that it's showing what the runtime has to understand to make this work, what libraries you need to really be able to exploit what the runtime knows, and then what app model frameworks that we ship at Microsoft that will exploit both of those things. So if you just use right. MVC, you just go file and use MVC, you'll get all this benefit without having to change any lines of code that you get today. But if you're the type of person who builds a serializer or a transform, or you need to write a custom endpoint and you have your own custom protocol, then you'll be able to use the blue boxes to do that now. And then if you're really crazy and you want to get right down to the runtime level primitives and just deal with memory, you'll be able to do that as well. Cool. All right, I got three more. Uh, let me see, this is uh, Christos and he's writing about real-time applications using ASP.NET Core, SignalR, and Angular. Um, and I believe this is still, uh, honestly, I'm yeah, gonna that's, be... sign that's probably the dead SignalR? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, not totally dead, and I mean, it's working right here. Yeah. No, I mean, it's yeah. the SignalR that has no future. Like, there was a version of, like, we originally ported the SignalR code base mm -hmm. to .NET Core, like, three years ago, and then it sat in GitHub and had no one looked at it for, for two years. Um, and now we have an entire team who's building SignalR from the ground up for .NET Core. Yep. Um, and they, this is not using that because we don't even have packages being produced in that right now, I think. Like, we're literally still building that out, so. Cool. But the high-level API is the same. So if you use hubs, it'll it kind of just looks the same. All right, uh, so uh, this is .NET Core versioning by Jonathan. Um, so he's just uh, talking about uh, looking at at .NET Core versioning and explaining some of the current and LTS releases. I think there was an official post on on this as well, of course, but you know, it's, um, talking about about that. Yeah. Cool. This one is um, from Tim, and he's talking about not your granddad's .NET. So I just thought this was kind of an interesting approach to it. So he's he's talking about um, you know uh, pipes what? and. You're talking um, about pipelines, the thing that I just ranted about. Yeah, before. and you know what? I'm going to be straight up honest. I was just about to read this, and Scott was like, hey, we're starting super early today because we're using a new screen change. I'm just this. calling you out. Yeah. Unacceptable. Was, so. Yeah, no, that's a good article. So he's been helping us uh, during the prototyping phase of the pipeline stuff. He wrote a, a TLS pipeline wrapper oh. so that you could um, basically implement uh, TLS or SSL um, over a pipeline to do encryption and decryption and do it in a fast way. So he didn't know any of this stuff previously. He kind of, he talks about how he sort of fell into this, but he, he just got pulled into a chat room or he was in there and people were talking about it, he got interested. And then he went and dug through the source code for SSL stream of how it worked and he rewrote it for pipelines. Um, he has, I think he has an implementation that works on SSPI, which is the Windows um, security uh, libraries. And then he has a version that works on OpenSSL, uh, which is what we use cross-platform, so. Very cool. All right, Pretty I'm cool. Done. Hit stop screen sharing. It's nice. Awesome. I like that. Yeah, it worked. Cool. I'm trying to minimize you, though. Yeah. You're always <laughs> doing that, Scott. I know. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Cool. Um, you're getting lots of lots of interesting feedback on, on, uh, on Twitter. People are appreciating that we're trying to move beyond Hangouts, see what other options are there. I like open source and standards-based options like this one. Uh, mostly just comments on the UI, and that's good. We got 150 odd people here, which is pretty pretty sweet. Um, it'll be interesting also to see the persistent chat and all that kind of stuff as well. Yeah. Cool. Anything that you have you want to share or show, uh, demo? Well, I mean, just to talk more about what's happened since we haven't been on the air. It's been three weeks since we had a show. Has we it had been that the long? you know yeah some yeah. I mean, if there's two shows, it's three weeks. So no, you're right. You're right. It's tough because I was at Connect, you know, trying to you know, do right by the team, and Maria gave a great talk, and I would oh, gave yeah. a talk. We showed Visual Studio 2017. We saw the perf stuff that was all the rage. Yeah. Uh, the hacker news coverage seemed to be fairly positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. I think, I think, I think people, it was a good release. 
people feel like we're we're actually serious like with each new release there is that 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 statement like you know we're serious about this aren't you you know there was um, there was a thing today on the front page of hacker news just talking about the the whole ben's magic number three <laughs> whatever that pull request on castrol yeah so, the castrol, one that we just accepted yeah so. Months in the making that one that was crazy. <laughs> what is that? Can you give me? Oh, some so there's a there's a there's a there's a point in Kestrel's code where when bytes are coming in off the wire, it's basically when we're parsing HTTP, mm -hmm. and we. Uh, looking at blocks of bytes at a time. We do that using the vectorization stuff that we've spoken about a couple of times. Right. Um, once we run the vector operation and we get back a result, that result will tell us, yes, there was a byte that you're interested in in this chunk of bytes, but mm -hmm. it doesn't tell us where. So it gives us back, because it basically it gives you a result in the same size that, that you pass to it. So if right. you pass in a 64-bit um, uh, a, a block of, of bytes or eight bytes, you get back a result that's eight bytes. And you have to find, well, where is the byte that I care about, right? Mm -hmm. um, because we're looking for a carriage return line feed or something like that. Um, and surprisingly, like in plain text, that actually shows up on the profiles because the vast majority of time is just passing the bytes as they come in off the wire and turning them into HTTP objects. And so previously we were using uh, what's called a, a, a quasi tree search, which was basically a binary tree search through the resulting bytes that came back mm -hmm. and so we were trying to check one half against a known mask and then if that didn't work we check the other half and, if that, and then we go like dive down half every time before we found the region it was in so right. like in worst case it was I don't know, whatever the o, big o notation is log in or something i don't know um and so that was okay but then someone discovered that there are you know there are other interesting uh, bit things that you can do for these types of patterns. And spe uh, specifically, the chess community, um, from my understanding, has, in building chess software, um, they have to deal with a lot of these type of problems. It's like, I need to find the least significant blah, blah, blah in a set of matrix of blah, blah, blah. And they have all these crazy sort of tricks and mathematical um, algorithms that they use to do these things. And some of these are only um, very recently known, like in the last decade or so. Uh, there's, a, there's a very good page on Stanford's website that's called a like, bit pack something 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 and it has all these interesting um, algorithms for doing stuff one of them was called a de Bruijn sequence or a de Bruijn sequence I'm not really sure how to um to uh, to pronounce it but it basically okay. you, you there's an algorithm that you can run given an alphabet of so many characters long and the payload size of things composed of that alphabet you can sort of do math and then come up with a magic number mm -hmm. that you can then bit shift with like crazy bit math to find very quickly through just a couple of CPU operations where the least significant or most significant bit in a given sort of example of a word made up of that alphabet exists. So using that, um, someone like like the last three months, they've been going through all these crazy um, iterations on that to find the fastest possible way of performing this, what seems like a very trivial thing, like scan a bunch of bytes and find the byte that we're interested in. Taking into consideration things like how the jitter works how the vector libraries work, what generation of CPU you have, what opcodes get generated based on what version of the JIDA that you have, because you know the difference between running 17 opcodes and running eight opcodes um, is significant when you're doing it this many times, but depending on what, what opcodes they are and what generation of CPU you have, you have to take that into account as well. Like So at some point, like I just cease understanding exactly what they're all talking <laughs> sure. about. But I read it anyway, and it's really interesting. So this, this, this pull request has been active for, for months now, and it's had uh, ben and then like three other people from the community have jumped in and then we've had someone from the JIT team who's on this PR as well because they've made fixes in the JIT as a result of this type of investigation. They say, oh, we found some problems with the vectorization support. It's, it's suboptimal when you do these types of oper operations and the JIT team's like, oh, well, we'll fix that in the next version of the JIT. Can you rerun it with this build and da 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 da, da. And so anyway, end result, it got checked in today, I think. And on our big iron here, it results in a 5% improvement for the plain text benchmark. Five, so we okay. went from 5 million to 5.25 million or something like that, um, requests per second. So the, the real world perf improvements on a big machine um, where there's a quarter of a million requests per second. People need, to, it's also worth pointing out the amount of patience required. Mm -hmm. Like you pointed out something, you can have a throwaway statement. Oh, well, the pull request was open for months. Yeah. That's a big deal, but you, know, you, you can't just go off by yourself, do a huge pull request, send it off to you and the team and expect it to be done in a week. Right. Additionally, you have to be prepared for discussion to occur, mm -hmm. 
other things other things down and possibly upstream of you have to figure those kind of things out if you decide to like drop it wait a month get mad yeah say fine screw you all i don't want to be involved but the, one of the things that is fun about about Ben and of course other people who've worked in the community yep. is their their patience and their willingness to stick with it. Mm -hmm. But the the benefit is immense. Well, yeah, and it wasn't just open and idle; it was open and in discussion. In and then went a little bit idle while we were busy shipping 1.1 because we didn't have the cycles to go and do the review. And then Stefan and um, a couple of others on the Kestrel team like did the work over the last couple of days to actually go through and review this line by line and really understand because some of this code is incredibly gnarly, mm -hmm. and obviously we care about having the code be understandable, the next person has to come along, has to understand. And like even, even in the review, we'd found places where reordering two lines broke Kestrel. And we knew about that, but we hadn't properly commented the places where that was important because of lock synchronization and rubbish like this. Um, and like Ben's like, oh, I didn't realize that. And that's because, yeah, well, we forgot to write the comments there. So then we went a sweep and we mm. made sure we commented all those places appropriately. Because we had we only knew that because we had broken it ourselves six months ago. We had done we had done the same <laughs> thing. Oh, look, it's faster. We'll reorder these things and didn't realize we'd broken it until we ran a bunch of other tests. Mm. And so you know, at this level, the code is you know pretty complicated. And so it takes a bunch of eyes and a bunch of deep thinking to really appreciate. Um, you know, whether this is actually the right change. But as a result, we've gotten through this, the tests have passed, we've got a good 5% improvement in plain text. And as a result of the investigation, Ben has said, oh, and I've noticed as part of this investigation, there's a whole bunch of other low hanging fruit of the same caliber in lots of other places to do with how we're scanning bytes. Mm -hmm. So he, you know, he's focused on this one and now he's gonna go and apply what he's learned in other areas and see if we can chip away and get another couple of percent here or 3% there or 5% there. Plus the JIT team has improved the JIT so if you're using a new CPU architecture, we can improve the, the code yet, uh, you know, even more and make it easier to understand because the JIT can do the hard work rather than us and having to do the hard work in the code. So yeah, it's great stuff. Seriously. But, you know, one other thing just to, to echo and, and go on from what Scott was saying about like it, that it's, it's a conversation. I was talking to Ben at MVP Summit and there's an interesting part in this long pull request where he came up with this Ben's magic number, which is yes. a long and you and it's like, Specially designed so that when you and it with certain things, it's going to give you the, it, so it's all one and operation that like immediately you give it a string, like the string as an int and it like give you the position. Yeah. And so it, then it's like, literally, a, it's literally a number that if you bit mask it with random input, mm -hmm. you are guaranteed to get a correct result. As long as the input is a certain size, yeah. you will get a correct result. That's as insane. in yeah. it will give you the correct number that represents what, place in the input is the character that you're looking it sounds, for. Sounds like the kind of thing that old Microsoft would have patented. <laughs> well, so, so the funny thing with this is that Ben came up with this and for a day or two, he said he was, the ha his wife was like, you have never been this happy. Like you're so like, and then, <laughs> and then somebody else was like, well, if you just bit shift it by two places, yeah. then the number is a lot simpler and it's this and this. And then he was all depressed and his wife, wife was like, well, what's wrong? And he's like, he's right. It is a better number than mine. <laughs> <laughs> Ben's magic number prime. Yeah. I think there was really another right. point he said that he hit some wall and went to bed because he had a headache. Uh -huh. And then he woke up in the middle of the night and went, wait, and then tried it again, <laughs> like figured the thing out. Because he'd done a whole bunch of research trying to find the magic number. He, like, he didn't want to have to compute it. He was hoping to find one else who had a similar scenario, had already generated this magic number. Because a lot of the work is in generating the number. Um, and then he would just plug that number into our case and it would work. Mm -hmm. um, but in the end, he had to build his own. And then, like you said, it got derived and derived and people simplified it and we've ended up where we are now. So anyway, crazy. it's it's crazy, crazy stuff. Anyway, so that, that happened this week. Um, we had the MVP Summit the week before Connect, which is why we weren't on the air that week. And we, uh, John just talked about the hackathon uh, results uh, out of that. And so the, a bunch of the MVPs built some great stuff. Um, we talked to the MVCs a bunch, uh, MVPs a bunch about what we're planning for next year. Um, I will start, uh, I plan to do a write-up, like a very high level write-up of the sort of the big rocks, as I call them, um, of the next version of ASP.NET Core, the, stuff, the one that comes after 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, so basically themes for next year, like the things that we care about as a team, again, we're not a huge team, um, but sort of the pillars, the four or five things that we care about, and then those are the things that we're using to drive the features, and then some high level features that fall out of that. Uh, we have that list now, so I'm just polishing that up and I'll get that published in the next couple of weeks. Um, and the team's starting to work on that now. Uh, beyond that, what else? Uh, the the alpha of the and I apologize ahead of time for the versioning everything here. We know this isn't the, the we're certainly not in a case where we've chosen the optimum versions for all the things that we've released, unfortunately. But the preview three 
SDK for .NET Core, which is the MS Build based .NET Core tooling, the one that ships in VS 2017 RC. We have called that alpha quality, even though it's preview three, which is after preview two, which was beta quality. And even though it ships in VS 2017 RC, yes, I apologize. Um, that is available to people who want to try uh, play with it now. It is alpha quality. So there are a lot of issues with it and we are working every day actively to get that fixed um, and to, or to improve that, I should say. And uh, we're having meetings on that every day and people are working on that every day. So before VF 2017 RTMs, um, that tooling will get a lot better. But for people who want to try it out right now, they can, not everything works. Um, and like I said, we're working on it. So if you are interested, uh, go ahead. There are some issues if you install it side by side with VS 2015, uh, specifically if you're doing .NET Core, but there are workarounds for all of those. They are listed up on the on the, on the ASP.NET tooling repo. Um, the, the only workaround I had to do was just change the path. My path environment variable had some stuff added to it after I installed VS 2017 RC, and if I just sort of flip a couple of them around, then everything that I needed just started working. So all that's documented in the known issues. So if you're game and you want to look at that, you, you can, otherwise just wait until it's baked. Um, so that happened, what else is going on? Um, 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 um. Oh, so I added some features to the Live ASP.NET website uh, to do what we're doing right now, right? Uh, to, to change it so that we could embed this new Aerial Spaces stuff on the homepage. So I decided to live stream my coding of that last Friday. It's something I've wanted to do for a long time. It's like just if I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to sit down for an hour or a couple of hours and just do some coding, I'll just stream it on YouTube as I do it. So I did that, and it was a little agonizing because it turned out i have forgotten how to code, and I had to <laughs> I purge a lot of things in my brain. Um, but I said we got that through. to someone. I said that to someone recently, and like, as a joke. Actually, you know, it was at the Connect keynote. You know, I was like, I'm just slapping the keyboard because I really have no idea what I'm doing. And they're like, Are you sure? And I'm like, Kind of. You know. <laughs> so you know, if you don't, if you don't exercise that muscle for a week. No, you know. I had about I don't know. I had fifty or sixty people, maybe about like thirty or forty people watching while I was doing it, and they were giving me suggestions. John was there. To be fair, date me... math is horrible, right? I mean, like... and I had to do date math, right? <laughs> and so since then, Hashamko has sent a PR that does actual date math, and I okay. accepted it today, and I tested, it and it does work. And it's like seven minus day of the week plus five oh, mods. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and it actually gives it to you. Um, so I, I made that today. We just did the naive while loop uh, during the video. But most of the video is actually, first of all, futzing about with the tooling, because I, I hadn't updated this laptop, so I, I was getting errors in the solution. I had to update the VS tooling, so that took 10 minutes. And then it was CSS. It was like me being anal and caring about how it looked, and that like you could tab into the new dropdown. I don't know if you noticed yeah. the work I did, Scott. Um, so that like you, when you set the next date on the admin screen now, there's a little drop down that says next Tuesday and it suggests yep. the time to next Tuesday. It's so I built that. Things. Yeah, so I built that and I even, you know, I made sure the keyboard worked. And if you tabbed it on and hit enter, it put it like I did all that stuff. And so just making that work well took an extra you know, half hour. And so, but a lot of that was me remembering how to code jQuery. And like, <laughs> first of all, it was remembering, remembering that I didn't have jQuery because I was trying to do it with this like document.query selector all and like raw events for a bit. And then I was like, wait a second, I have jQuery. So I deleted all that code and I just did it with jQuery. And then I probably forgot how to use jQuery. So then I had to go and look up how to use jQuery. Um, so that was all a bit of a comedy of errors, but they got there in the end and you saw the end result. And people seem to enjoy the fact mm -hmm. that I sucked as much as programming as <laughs> everyone else does. Um, so that was good. But I got to feel the, the you know, feel the pain. So I enjoyed it. And so I will do it again next time I have something to code on. I will do that again because people seem to get some value out of it. Speaking of website updates, did you see the new .NET website? Have we talked about that? I did. It's prettier. I still think the download page is far too confusing. And I keep I do I, I do think it, it is it is hard, right? How do you get people to click on the right thing that will set them up for success? Yeah, and as I, I think I sent this email to, like you were on the thread this week, it's like six people I've been ranting to this about this internally. Um, I, and I think I screenshotted the landing page of the Node website, yeah. and where, where they have two buttons, because they have an LTS and they have a current. And I said, yeah. everything beyond the two buttons here, we have to have a really good reason for, for those to exist. But, but the problem is, yeah, so it's a good point. When you go to the Node website, they notice you're on Windows, yep. so they, they hide stuff from you. Yeah. And we try to notice things as well. So if you click download in .NET Core, we're making you right now click on Windows again when we detected it before. Well, the other thing I had a trouble with is with the current design on downloads, you click on .NET Core, and then there's the three boxes that represent the operating systems. And then immediately yeah. underneath that, there's a table with buttons. 
And my brain doesn't disassociate those two things. I think that yeah. they're linked. And so I don't notice the step-by-step -step instructions or the all downloads heading. Like I don't, it's something about yeah. the styling that I just don't see those. And yeah, so I and look I at that and I go, there are f seven buttons that I could click on and I don't know what I'm supposed to do right now. And I've gotten feedback from like, you know, people that we know and know our stuff and you're gonna bring it up so people can see what I'm ranting about. So it, it mixes metaphors. I mean, it does we'll, mix we'll, metaphors, yes. So if we go here, I like that, that's nicer. Yes, I, I like that it gets you here quickly. Yes. I like that it has, you know, random people in their comments. I assumed when I clicked here, this wouldn't exist. Right. I, I figured you'd get off to like here quickly. Right. Which I like. See, like, and, and this is the other battle is that we, we've tried to optimize for people. We're trying to optimize for multiple audiences with one UX here. And so like we've had, I've had people tweet at me this week saying, like, and I know them and they know the product and they just want to get 1.1 and they're confused. Like they don't know how to download 1.1. 1, 1, 1. 1. The getting started experience that you're looking at right now is not designed for those customers. It's designed for the people who have heard about .NET Core and want to come and get it for the first time. And yeah. so we're trying to find that right balance between how do you, well, just, you know, if you know what you want to get, how do you, you get it? you go them? here, there's other downloads is a way of saying, I know more. Yes. And then you're here. Yes. So I want to make it, I liked it before where it's like you go download and there'd be one more click and it'd be other downloads. Yep. So it, it's interesting. Uh, if you have comments and questions about that or you have a strong opinion, folks that are listening, uh, you know, tweet me and I will, uh, I will uh, yeah. get the feedback to the owners of those pages. Yeah, I'm, we're working on it. Like we've been, we've been emailing through the week on this to figure out how we can make it better and you know, we're all keen to do that. So there's been a couple of questions come in. Maybe we should just answer some of those before we drop off. For Let's today. do that and, uh, before we do, because we okay. need to get going. So the last one I just saw, then I'll answer it because it's fresh in my mind. Uh, someone saw Nick Craver and I talking about on uh, Twitter about MVC4 project support in VS 2017. Uh, the, we removed that in RC. That is coming back, is my understanding, for the next release. Um, so if you, right now, if you try and open a, an MVC project that is that was created before MVC5, so I want to say that was less than VS 2015, maybe. Um, and you try and open it in 2017, it just won't open. You'll get the project type, uh, uh, project mm. type not supported error. Uh, where we're doing a little bit of work to bring that back, so at least you can open those projects, even if you can't create new MVC3 or new MVC4 projects. Um, mm. You can hack your project files to get around it if you know the right project type GUIDs and flavors to remove, which I did for next project. You can uh, get it to open again as long as you don't care about the specific tooling to work. Um, so yes, we are trying to fix that. Uh, do I grab the 1.1 one, one runtime or the 1.1 one, one SDK? That is the other feedback that we've had this week regarding this, is that why, what is the difference between the .NET Core runtime and the .NET Core SDK? So, short story, if you're a developer, you should download the SDK. If you're a server administrator, you may only want to install the runtime. So the runtime is what is required to get .NET XE and then point that at a compiled assembly, which represents an application that you want to run. So like .NET foo.ell, will run the Foo console app after you've compiled it using the .NET SDK. So if you're running a server and you don't want the SDK on the server, you can just download the runtime by itself. But if you're a developer, you generally just want to download the SDK. And they install side by side and they carry the runtime with them. The thing that you have to be a little wary of is the SDK currently only carries a single runtime version with it, which is the version that the SDK itself was compiled against. So if you care about LTS versus current, then you need to be mindful of which SDK you get. And you may want to like download the 1.1 SDK, but then install the 1.0 runtime so that you end up with both. Or you could just install the 1.0 SDK first and then install the 1.1 SDK. And then you would end up with both runtimes and the latest SDK. Um, this is just the side effects of how we've split the concept of the runtime and the SDK or the tooling in .NET Core 1.0. We're hoping to smooth this out and make it a little easier to understand in the next wave of changes that we're planning for next year. But right now, that's the lay of the land. Okay. What else have we got here? You looking just, at the questions? I'm trying to look at the questions, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to find ones that are actually questions addressed to us and not just people talking to, it, talking to each other. That's an interesting platform. Yeah, that would be nice point. for this thing. If you had a formalized Q&A yeah. click, I've answered the question, Separate versus the chat. back channel chat. Yeah. 
Yeah, that would be really good, actually. Yeah, and I actually closed the chat, and I can't get it back. From oh. <laughs> I'm surprised people so I, are saying that they're they have questions about watching on their phone, and I just had never expected anyone. Does it work on their phone? No. Uh, Someone said it worked on a Samsung Galaxy. But people were saying in the past they've watched on their phone, and I'm shocked because I. Ah, uh, that's because they were using YouTube. Yeah, I I just would yeah. never have thought you'd watch this on your phone. So. I've watched yeah, it on my phone. I mean, I've watched you... it after the fact on my phone. I okay. tend to watch like this off. back, but. Okay. I've never watched it live, obviously. On my phone. I have watched it live on my phone, actually. I think a couple of the times I wasn't here, I, I may have watched it live on my phone. That's interesting. <laughs> uh, I'm not seeing any other questions. If anyone has a question, just type uh, it in again. I I'm not, I, it's, it's kind of hard to see the ones that are addressed to us. Um, question. Get Fowler on more often. <laughs> that's, that's, that's an odd, he was on today. Phrase. I would like to have people who are not us on more often, but people who are not us are very often chipping. Yeah, they're often they're often doing coding. When stuff. you don't, when you're not here, Damien, you're usually in like the war room trying to get the thing. Shipped. Yeah, and I will say that you know, just by nature of how the team is put together, other people tend not to have the full breadth of like coverage of the whole product, like Fowler and I do. Um, and so when you get other people on, it's generally because we want to specialize on a particular thing, um, because yeah, you know, that, that's the area that they work on. So, but we we've done that a number of times, and we can continue to do that when we have interesting things um, to dive into. Uh, question: Any update on other SDKs for .NET Core, MS Azure, Graph, etc.? Yeah, so we have a an acknowledged issue right now where plenty of the Azure SDKs haven't moved to .NET Core. Um, there's a couple of things that we're doing to help that. Obviously, the .NET Standard 2 work that we've talked about a couple of times on here. We talked about the Connect again. We talked about the MVP, MVP Summit, um, which is basically let's bring back most of the APIs so that they work on all .NET platforms, including .NET Core, that will make it easier to port libraries in general. Um, and that's happening sort of first half next year. Um, the second thing, obviously, is that we're helping those teams just port the code that they have right now. Because um, a lot of them have PCLs, so that they should be quite uh, straightforward to get them to work on the current versions of .NET Standard. We're helping them do that. And so we're plowing through that to try and get more of that stuff uh, working on .NET Core sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Um, are you guys planning on bringing someone to talk about static HTTP, HTTP client and does TTL caching issues and stuff? Uh, I was not. That's a totally different team. I wasn't, we, we have not had a plan to do that. Um, well, part of the reason this came up, there was a blog post a month or so back that yes. I mentioned, and then we were like, hey, maybe we should get somebody on to talk about that because people were wondering about, you know, should they keep an instance? Should they, you know, like... Well, that's well defined. I mean, that the answer there is, is yes. You should use one instance, like that. That is known and documented, and that's what you should be doing. Uh, and then there, were, I forget the exact thing, but there were questions about, well, does is that going to work with DNS if you do an? Yeah. So there are issues in that DNS resolution. Only I think my understanding is the DNS resolution is cached in the instance. So if you need to forcibly refresh DNS, you'll need to replace the instance. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, that that's something that frankly is is, is a discussion best had on a GitHub issue on the repo that owns that component, rather than just us randomly talking about it sure. here, I think. Okay. Uh, do, do, do any, any estimated ship dates for .NET Core 1.2 VS 2017 RTM? No. <laughs> None that I can tell you anyway. Um, what else? .NET Core targeting full framework able to be side by side with, say, web forms like MVC5 can. Uh, yeah, so I mean, .NET, not .NET Core itself, but ASP.NET Core as it is today is just a bunch of libraries, effectively, and it runs on either .NET Core or on .NET Full Framework, um, and so that you can run those things side by side with each other or anything else for that matter. Um, .NET Framework itself doesn't support side by side versioning other than the .NET, uh, you know, .NET Framework 3.5 and .NET Framework 4.x, which are side by side components on Windows, um, but that's kind of where the side by side ends. So I hope that answers your question. Um, scrolling down. So is an app which was compiled, is a good question, is an app which was compiled against Netcore App 1.0 supposed to be able to run under 1.1? Um, so this is one of the aspects of the experience right now that I'm not fully um, satisfied with. The short answer is no, um, but the long answer is yes. <laughs> Um, that's one character longer than no. Um, so by default, if you have a Netcore app 1.0 application, um, when you build and publish that, what you get in the output file, in the output folder, is a file called uh, runtime config.json, I believe it is. 
And inside of that is the name of the framework and the version that you want to run on, microsoft.netcore.app, some version number. And that's what .NET XE uses to figure out where the .NET framework is on your machine, or .NET Core, I should say, what version, and then boot it. So if you compile against 1.0, and then you take that application and you run it on a machine that only has Netcore 1.1, then it will not load, because the behavior of the .NET XE host currently is that if it can't find an exact match for the first two digits, the major and the minor, it will fail to load the application. It will roll forward the patch numbers for you. So if you depend on 103 or 101, and then you put it, sorry, if you depend on 100, and then you put that on a machine that only has 101, it will boot. It'll order, we call that roll forward, it'll automatically roll you forward to the newly patched version. It does not roll forward for minor versions. You can force it, though. You can pass an argument to .NET XE that tells it the name of the framework and the version that you want to try and attempt to boot the application onto. It basically just ignores whatever was in the runtime config file and boots on top of that framework. So you can do that, um, but the default answer is no. If you just run it, it'll fail. Um, that is something that we have planned to revisit because we're not, you know, we were kind of waiting for feedback to see what people thought of that behavior and it's something that we can revisit over time how that works. Uh, will the CS project tooling be finalized with VS 2017 RTM, or will it still be in preview? The current plan of record is that it will be finalized in the RTM. Um, that is the current plan. Plans can change, but that is the current plan that as a team we are working to. We are working very hard to have that be true. So that at the same time, the VS 2017 RTMs, the .NET Core tooling uh, will RTM as well. And that's the new tooling based on CS Proj. Um, we will let people know if that changes. But that's what we're working towards. Um, will this is, that's the same question. I'm literally reading the same question I just answered. Um, how, along is, how far along is the basic pipeline API? Uh, the basic API is quite far along. It hasn't gone through formal API review yet. Um, but if it's something that you could use right now, we know we, we are, there's a few active members in the community, including a couple of the folks from Overflow who have been testing out the API for us and using it with some of their um, custom uh, server code, um, and we're using that to help shape the API and, and, and ensure it's good. If you're interested in that, tweet David Fowler, and he can point you in the right direction on how to get involved using those bits. That, I think, I think that code base just landed in the CoreFX repos last week. I think, I think I'm saying that right. And I may be thinking of something else. If that's true, then there should be MyGet packages for those things uh, soon, and you can start consuming them as MyGet packages. Um, note that it's intertwined with a bunch of the other memory stuff and runtime stuff, so I'm not quite sure how usable it is in an isolated state. That's why I'm telling you to defer you know, to Fowler and ask him. Uh, I can't get one one web app to deploy to Azure targeting net four six. Will who do I submit an issue to about this? Oh, interesting. Um, good question. Probably log an issue on the home repo, ASP.NET slash home. Give us as much detail about your app. If there's a very simple reproduction, like if I can just do file new, um, update a project JSON, and then try and deploy, and it fails, and tell us what those steps are, and then we can try it and get that looked at. It should work. No, I. No, okay. They they had referenced a Stack Overflow post, but when I click yeah. through on it, it's a vb.net something or other. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's it. I mean, at the end of the day, it's always best to. Yeah. Uh, if you log an issue on there with all the details, then we can get it assigned, and someone can look at it. Um, let's have a look. Mind blown. Oh, great. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they're talking about, but that's great. Um, <laughs> server side UI. No, 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 no. We need to get wrapping up. Yeah, I have sorry. I'm just trying to see if there's like one or two here. great questions at the end I can, uh, I can end with. Sure. Oh, question. When do we get URL based culture localization? Uh, in 1.1. So we shipped uh, two features in 1.1 that allow this. Uh, we have the Middleware as, what do you call it? Middleware as uh, oh filters. Middleware mm -hmm. as MVC filters that we shipped in 1.1. And we shipped a route data localization provider um, in the same timeline so that you can now configure the localization middleware to run after routing as part of the MVC pipeline so that you can capture the culture name from a route, which is what you kind of would want to do to do this, um, and then you can run it through MVC. Now, if you want to do this without using MVC, which might be valid if you, for whatever reason, then you can just easily write your own localization provider 
Um, it's not very complicated at all. We've, we've supported this since 1.0. And then you can just write the code in your localization provider to find the part of the URL that you want to use for the culture name and then flow that through the system as appropriate. I mean, I think you could probably do that in 20 lines of code. It's really not that difficult. But the one that we've shipped is based on routing and you can plug it in assuming that you are running something that runs as part of routing like MVC or something that is dispatched to from routing, I should say. Um, one more. What is, this? Um, what is the state and future of .NET build dash dash native? Can we rely on it to be stable on multiple platforms? So the .NET native support as it relates to .NET core applications um, is a much longer term effort. Um, I think we showed it at the Connect event last year. It was kind of thrown in there at the last minute as, as when we were announcing the .NET core CLI to show the dash dash native thing. Um, it won't be shipping in the VS 2017 timeframe. It won't be shipping in the uh, sort of uh, version after 1.1 timeframe. It's, it's a more of a longer lead effort. It is actively being worked on. Uh, the runtime is core RT, and that's up on GitHub at slash .NET slash core RT. And we are continuing to investigate uh, what it would take to bring an AOT story to .NET Core. Um, we have prototypes of stuff that work right now, but there's a lot of things that we'd have to solve all the way up the stack, all the way up to MVC to get that to be a turnkey experience. And we don't really want to ship it until that's true. So it's still on our radar. It's still being actively worked on, but it's not in the same time frame as the other things that we've talked about. Uh, and someone's asked, what is Core IT that's different to Core? Core IT is the, is the version of the runtime that gets compiled into your application when you do .NET Native. Um, you know, core CLR is what you run on when you're managed. Core IT is what you run on when you're a native application that's still using managed memory allocation. It's basically GC and a bunch of other little things that are required to have your app run on top uh, after it's being compiled natively. And that's the limit of my understanding of what it does. All right, so I think we're good. Cool. Cool. That's a wrap. So um, as we said before, uh, big thanks to Aerial Spaces for letting us use this space and try it out. You can see that it's beta, but it's pretty cool. We're right now we're on their staging site. Had 150 plus people, no issues, nothing crashed, everything's still running. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of good UX feedback from for them on the chat and things like that. I see the tweets going by. I'm digging it. Um, concerns that we saw on Twitter are, is it still going to go on YouTube? Yes, I will upload this to YouTube and you can watch it later. Um, that's pretty cool. And there also should probably be a way to watch this again. Yes. In, and you can watch it and change the camera angles and switch the screens and go full screen and not after the fact. So basically a playback of this space, nice. which is cool. So we're just exploring, we're looking at it, but uh, feel free to uh, direct any questions or comments to me and or uh, use Ariel on Twitter, and uh, we'll see you uh, next week. All right. Dramatic zoom out. Dramatic. Okay, let's double click on Damien, everyone, for the dramatic <laughs> zoom out. <laughs> Engage the dramatic zoom out. All right, dramatic zoom out. Dramatic zoom out, it's so dramatic. Now we can narrow your spaces. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new jingle. <laughs> Bye, everybody. See ya.